tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. Rung by Brian S. Adelman I worked at a dog show once when I was 17. No, unlike Westminster, where they make the dogs prance around on an endless victory lap and balance plates on their noses, and none of that tuxedo crap. These were hunting dogs. It's a timed run, how fast they can retrieve game and such, only while the owners and judges are sitting up on a big hill with their stopwatches and probably a few flasks of whiskey, do they need some dope to sweat their balls off playing the role of the hunter. That's where I came in. You see, they set you up in this wide open field with a shotgun and a burlap sack filled to the gills with dead chickens. When the bougie types up on the hill give the signal, you fire the shotgun in the air and chuck the dead bird high so the dog can see it fall. Then all you gotta do is get the hell out of the way while the dog does its thing, and about five to ten minutes later you do it all over again. It wasn't all that bad, aside from the sunburn, all the flies, and the never-ending funk of dead livestock that you can still smell in your sleep. At lunch, they give you a brown bag containing a peanut butter sandwich, some chips, and a can of warm Coke. But it was $300 for a couple of days of work, and since it was my gym teacher, Mr. Lyons, who was running the show on his own ranch, all the money was under the table. That was some decent cash back in high school. Tell me I can fire a shotgun and you've got me sold, never mind the fact they were only blanks. The first day wasn't too rough. Getting to lunch was the worst part. After that, sundown seemed to creep up just around the corner. I figured I could ease off the gas some and get a little cocky the next day. I was there at the crack of dawn, barely able to stand, let alone hold a shotgun properly, when Lyons heaved another one of the burlap sacks at my feet like I'm supposed to be pleased as punch. Christ, that smell was awful. He spent a good minute eyeing me up. Looking a bit peaked there, he said with a raised brow. Been drinking? I kind of wiped my forehead and shuffled my feet, trying to make it less obvious that I was nursing a two-ton hangover. Then I shrugged and told him I hadn't been eating much and that maybe I was starting to feel it. I bet, he said. Hopefully you can find a way to work that scattergun without blowing your goddamn face off. I thought they were only blanks. They are. But blanks or not, you suddenly find yourself on the wrong side of that barrel, and you'll wind up with a hell of a lot more than a skin rash, boy. I laughed and said, <laughs> I'm more worried about what's in that sack. None of them held up for more than an hour yesterday before they started falling apart like cotton candy. The tricky part about working with dead things, you see, is that nature is always working against you. Rigor mortis sets in faster than you'd think and when your whole job is to throw said dead thing into the air, a little stiffness can make matters interesting. The first piece that breaks off is usually the wings, so then you gotta grab them by the head. When that eventually pops off like a champagne cork, you're stuck lobbing what are basically feathered footballs. Well, Lyons just smirked and gave his word they'd hold up. How do you know? I asked. Next got rung less than 15 minutes ago, he answered. They're as fresh as daisies. Now, keep in mind this sack must have weighed close to 50 pounds. Let's say the average chicken only weighs a couple of pounds. That's about 25 of them all bunched up in there. That's a lot of neck wringing. And only 15 minutes earlier, according to Lyons, who looked like he'd hardly broken a sweat... I hauled all my gear into the truck and Lyons drove me out to the drop-off point. Setting up for the first round gets to be a little exercise in patience while the bougie types are busy collecting themselves a quarter mile out, all laughing and setting up their parasols and whatnot. 
Meanwhile, it's hardly even seven o'clock and you've got more grime on you than they've seen in a year. But once we get started, it doesn't take long to fall into the rhythm of things. The radio crackles, you fire a shot, toss the bird like some gizzard-packed satchel, duck, wait, and then reset, rinse and repeat. And you know what? Lyons was right. That stock was as fresh as daisies. The only problem was that a good number of them were already missing their heads, and every time I pulled one out, I couldn't help noticing the lack of blood all around. It wasn't a detriment, really, just something that gave me pause. I didn't mention anything when Lyons drove up with the restock. He'd come over every couple of hours, usually with the same recycled batch. But once they'd inevitably fall apart after a certain period of time, you knew there was always a fresh bag ready to go. When I radioed that I was completely out of stock, there was only a short delay before I saw his truck tearing down the hill toward me. Right off the bat, something appeared off as he tossed me the sack, shutting his eyes and grimacing. That's when I saw that his left hand was all bandaged up. He didn't acknowledge it, and if I learned anything growing up with a hard-nosed mother, it's that sometimes it was better to keep your trap shut, and that gauze only got redder and redder each time he came down. It was hot out. So hot it made you forget about all the miserable knuckle-stripping winters when you were praying for warm weather. So hot that a glass of tap water might as well have been a chalice of aged wine served atop a silver platter. Then there was that smell. Maybe the long hours were already starting to catch up to me, but I almost ran through a whole pack of smokes before lunch, which still didn't help. And unlike the day before, sundown was like watching paint dry. My arms and neck were all burnt to hell, and my face felt like beef jerky. It got to be that I didn't even feel like washing up. I just wanted to be as far from there as possible. I was putting away the shotgun when I heard a bang coming from one of the chicken coops. Sounded like a sack of potatoes. I checked it out, but couldn't see anything there. My ears told me otherwise, as I could hear the chickens in there bouncing all over the damn place, flapping around nervously and making these shrill noises. Sounded like maybe there was something in there with them. My eyes darted to see if I could get a better angle, maybe let the moon shine a bit. Just blackness. Nothingness. And when I saw a larger crack in the paneling near my knees... I crouched down and peered through that one, too. The funny thing was, I found something staring back at me. I jumped back. A big whiff of dirt and dust blew out of the crack in one short breath. Heavy, forceful stomps followed, then dragged toward the other side of the coop, through the small wired area, and finally out into the tall grass-lined property only to disappear by the time I made my way around. The hell you doing? A voice behind me bellowed. Lions. A cigarette cherry blazed over his face. I told him I thought I'd seen something, and he just laughed when he noticed the shotgun still clutched in my hands. <laughs> well, a hell of a lot you were going to do with that, he said. The smile left his face slowly as though something had suddenly dawned on him. He patted his smoke out on the bottom of his boot and asked me exactly what I thought I'd seen. I don't know, I told him. A person, I guess. I just heard a noise and checked it out. And? He moved closer. In the glow of a nearby bug zapper, I saw that his bandage badly needed changing. And nothing, I answered. Whatever it was took off down that way. Sounded like it might have dragged something off. Lyons scanned the tall grass. Then he grabbed the shotgun from me and said, Your money's on the kitchen counter. Lock up before you leave, will you? He looked out again over that tall grass and seemed to pretend that I was already gone. I locked up, just as he said. 
All the sports cars and brand new pickups that had lined the extended driveway just a few hours earlier were gone now, so I guess he didn't care if my filthy self left out the front. Besides, his mind had seemed to have been elsewhere. I didn't really give a damn. I was just glad to have my money and be done with it. The breeze felt pretty good as I cruised down that first stretch of back road. But then, out of the window, I could hear a cry that reminded me of a howling dog. And though lions certainly had a few of them, there was something unmistakably human about it. The way it bounced off the trees like the baleful moans of an opera singer. You know distress when you hear it. Sometimes it doesn't take words. I wouldn't have had a clue if I had heard it yesterday, but now my imagination was running wild and I knew who it belonged to. Something that stomped around like a silverback gorilla and sucked the blood out of headless chickens. Something that could make lion's hand leak like a broken faucet and get him all tensed up at the mere thought of being loose on his ranch. Something he thought was worth hiding, not just for me, but from all of his bougie dog show friends also. That cry I'd heard belonged to whatever was in that dark chicken coop, and I knew I would never know unless I pulled along the side of the road and doubled back. I was dumb enough to come back the second day. <laughs> Why should I play it smart now, then? I killed my lights as I neared. The moans had quieted, but were still lively enough to lead me back toward the coop, and I could hear lions. Goddamn animal, he said. He was standing inside the wiring, looking in through the coop's open door. If your mother, God rest her soul, could only see you now. He shook his head. You're gonna spend a night in there, and come morning... If I find you've gotten into any of them, I swear you'll be praying for the ass beating I gave you earlier, let me tell you. I hid behind a tree until he was gone, then tiptoed over to the wiring. He'd padlocked the door. I could hear breathing, quick, labored, and raspy in a way that made my throat itch. Hello? I called. The breathing relaxed. I'm not going to, you know, I want to talk, that's all. I moved to one of the cracks in the wood, listening to my pulse, but saw only the darkness. Though the breathing made me nervous, I decided that I had to do something. I got a bolt cutter from the tool shed and snapped off the padlock. The door creaked open. It's okay, I whispered. You can come out. I'm not going to hurt you. The breathing suddenly intensified like a churning engine, growing raspier and raspier, almost excitedly so. I just bought that lock yesterday, said Lyons. He was standing outside the wiring, a shotgun aimed square at my chest. It ain't right, locking somebody up like an animal. An animal, he said, sneering. That sounds about right. Don't give me that look. You're just a dumb kid sticking his nose where it doesn't belong. The hell do you know about raising a child, huh? He stopped suddenly and smiled. Looks like we have company. He didn't have to say anything. I knew those thumping footsteps, the odd dragging, the raspy breath that was now so close I could taste it. And in the stark moonlight, I saw it. Or rather, I saw her. She crawled on her belly using a pair of hulking arms, stamping the ground with these wide, meaty hands. Her burlap dress was in tatters, dragging behind her along with a pair of jutting, dead-as-doornail legs. She squealed and stamped toward me. Lyons blocked my way. Oh, no you don't, he said, raising the shotgun. Looks to me like she's a little sweet on you, don't you think? Well, she was still crawling toward me, and there was only a flimsy chicken wire and plywood door between me and Lyons, 
but he realized what I had in mind and pinned my wrist to the door. The barrel flashed, searing, white-hot pain. I collapsed, holding my hand to my chest. It was blackened, sticky, and felt like it was on fire. Huh, would you look at that, he said. Hell of a skin rash you got there, boy. Maybe you'd better hold up for tonight. I could feel her on me. She stank, smelling of stale, dried sweat. I closed my eyes, only opening them as I felt something warm and wet. She was licking up the bloody mess like a cat over a milk bowl, even making a soft, purring noise. She smiled at me in her own unique way, her hair lip spreading miles. Then, as lions leaned in, she suddenly began making these god-awful hissing sounds, and I could feel the full weight of her sliding over me. A horrible scream erupted from the other side of the wire. She was on him, crushing his neck with those massive hands, hands strong enough to wring the necks of 25 chickens like it was no harder than making a sandwich, hands strong enough to make Lion's eyes look more like cue balls sticking out of his head until they finally burst. She pushed herself up onto his chest and let out a victorious howl. There aren't any more shows now, and no more chickens. How could there be? Lizzie had free reign after that. Well, I had to call her something. And anyway, she looks like a Lizzie. You know, Elizabeth Bathory and all that. That's okay. She doesn't have much of a sense of humor either. Some people stopped by a while back, but didn't find anything. Lizzie made sure of that. It turns out, chickens weren't all she ate. She made sure to hide meat, too. I can't leave, you see. She won't let me. Funny how just talking nicely to someone can really put the hook on them. That's what Lyons couldn't wrap his head around that his daughter was growing up. Her tastes change, as well as her needs. She even insisted on us sleeping in the same bed, and how was I going to argue? She's got one hell of a grip, and believe me, she knows where to hurt a man. I found that out the hard way when I tried to make a break for it one night. And sometimes she gets mad for no reason, even when I try to stay out of her way. Playing house takes a lot out of you. There isn't much left anymore. Just a hand so that I can jot this down on some scrap paper I found crumpled up inside the coop. Someday, I won't even be able to do that. There aren't any chickens left, remember? Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.